How can we understand Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the implication for the end of days? Hi, I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. Joel, it's wonderful to have you on the program, and we have a very important message uh, about connecting what the Bible says about the war of Gog and Magog. So, Joel, welcome. Great to be with you, Carl. As always, um, questions you ask, and obviously with two and a half million downloads, apparently other people besides myself are finding it interesting as well. So I get asked this a lot over the years. Um, Help me understand, because this is not a prophecy uh, from Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many pastors or ministry leaders talk about. And so there's a dearth of information, and yet there's this sense that this seems like something we ought to focus on. And I agree with that. Yeah, this is one of those passages that in many people's understanding of Bible prophecy, they don't spend a lot of time on because, you know, they, it's kind of an interesting title and, and certainly it'd be the strangest sounding war that any of us in America have ever had is not World War II or, or what have you. But when the Bible talks about the war of Gog and Magog, there's an implication of like, huh, is that Armageddon? Is that some other thing? What is that? And who are these players in this prophecy, and I know you've spent a lot of time thinking, writing, talking about this very prophecy and the implications for today's Israel and today's uh, world that we live in. So maybe you can help us get started. Where is this prophecy found anyway? Happy to do it, Carl. Uh, one of the things that makes it even more confusing to people is that it's uh, this war of Gog and Magog is actually found twice in the Bible, and there are two entirely different wars, mm. okay? So one <laughs> version is found in Ezekiel 38 and 39, okay? And, and that's a classic focus in the Hebrew scriptures that many Jews who are not even that religious, they know about because they've heard about Gog and Magog throughout the synagogue, throughout the ages, and they think that war, whatever that is, that's coming before the Messiah comes. Mm. Okay? The Muslims also have an eschatology, an end time theology that deals with Gog and Magog. The term winds up in the Quran. Really? It's called the war of Juj and Majuj. But these are just differences of the linguistics of, of the people that were writing at the time. And even though it's a brief mention in the Quran, there's a lot of writing in uh, Islamic eschatology, you know, experts. That's an area we actually have to talk about on a future podcast, which I is, will. wait, the Muslims have an end times theology? Yeah. Absolutely they do, and it's very interesting, and in some cases very dangerous. So the main version that most Jews and Muslims are thinking about, if they think about it at all, is from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, what most Christians are thinking about comes from the book of Revelation, okay? And that, towards right towards the end of the whole book of Revelation, there's a section in which you've got Gog and Magog mentioned again. Yeah. And yet the details are significantly different so that when you study them closely and in parallel, you realize these are not the same events. Interesting. But they're both eschatological. They're both end times events in the Bible. So most people that aren't thinking carefully about it think, well, no, that's just, there's an Old Testament reference and there's a New Testament reference. It's the same thing. Actually, it isn't. Fascinating. So in that context, you know, we need to step back a little bit, maybe from some of our assumptions about these prophecies and maybe look really at what the text says. So who are Gog and Magog? <laughs> and, and what do they have to do with Israel in this context? Uh, happy to talk about it again. So the Ezekiel version uh, we'll walk through, and that's the version that happens in the last days. Mm -hmm. That term is repeated several times. We know it's an end times prophecy, but it happens from our understanding of all of the Bible, what, what the Apostle Paul calls the whole council of Scripture. We know as followers of Jesus, when you put it all together, the, the war of Gog and Magog that Ezekiel is describing happens prior to the second coming of Christ. Okay. okay. So in that sense, if you do a little algebraic equation and you take out a few of those words, the Jewish 
people that know about Gog and Magog and this big conflict that's coming, they're right that it comes before the Messiah comes. The addition is understanding that that's the Messiah coming back, right. not for the first time. That's the right. New Testament uh, biblical worldview. But the second Gog and Magog war happens after Christ has not only come, but he set up his thousand-year reign, mm -hmm. uh, often known as the Millennial Kingdom, that he's reigning from this city, from Jerusalem, for a thousand years. And at the end of that, the forces of Satan amass and, and pull together all kinds of people that were sort of giving lip service to the Messiah, but never really were for him. And they have this huge battle to try to wipe out the kingdom of God. And of course, they lose. Right. And then that's the end of the world. Literally, God destroys the world and creates a new heaven and a new earth. So you've got a Gog and Magog version prior to the second coming of Christ, and then at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Got it. The reason that's important, and again, we probably won't get into the, all those specifics on this podcast of how do we know that's different, but it is interesting and important because one of the events is in the end times, but it's not literally the end of all days. Right. The other one is the end of the world literally as we know it. And they're different. And why is the second war called Gog and Magog? It, because the first one, the Ezekiel version, is so cataclysmic. Wow. It's so determinative of human history going forward that for a thousand years, people think if anything like that happened again, I guess we're going to call it a war of Gog and Magog, like right. World War One. Mm -hmm. Well, let's call the next one World War Two. Like there's a pattern to this. That's a little bit of the reasoning. Fascinating. Now, Ezekiel 38, you know, our listeners will know because they're pretty smart. It comes after Ezekiel 36 and 37. Like, okay, this is not, this is the one. Well, you always, okay. you always educate us. Yes. I try, you know, I try to put the cookies on the lower shelf there, Carl. And <laughs> so why is that important though? Because of context. Ezekiel 36 and 37, you and I have talked about on this podcast right from the beginning of the whole program, which is these are the most famous prophecies ever in the Bible in which Israel is going to be reborn as a country, as a physical sovereign nation state in the last days of history, that the Jews are literally going to return en masse to the Holy Land to rebuild the nation of Israel, that the Jewish people, with God's help, are going to rebuild the ancient ruins of this only land mm -hmm. into a modern nation state. It's going to have an exceedingly great army. It's going to have tremendous economic prosperity. It's going to be a player having been resurrected as a country when it didn't exist for 2,000 years. Yeah. And one by one, we're watching those prophecies over the last 100 years come to pass. Sure. And you say that they're fulfilled? Um, you know, that's we, we've gotten into this before. Okay, maybe they're not fulfilled because it's all still happening. Jews are still coming from other countries to settle here. My family only came seven and a half years ago. There are millions more to come. And there are still more ancient ruins to rebuild and so forth. So, no, these prophecies haven't been fulfilled. I say that they've been filled. Yeah. <laughs> but we're heading towards fulfillment, okay? Right. That's important. Why? Because whatever Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about, and it is a complicated prophecy to study, but one of the things that you should be encouraged about as you think about this podcast is 38 can't happen until 36 and 37 are in motion. Okay. okay? There has to actually be a sovereign nation state of Israel in this land before this war can happen. Mm -hmm. And the Jews have to be back in the land. And the, you know, the ancient ruins have to be rebuilt and the deserts have to bloom. And that's happening, yeah. like dramatically happening. So this prophecy was written by the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel more than 2,600 years ago, okay? Or almost 2,600 years ago. He was living in Babylon in the day. Israel didn't even exist at, in his time. It, it had already been destroyed uh, by Nebuchadnezzar and the country had been, you know, burnt to the ground, essentially. So Ezekiel's writing about a time that Israel will be back in the land and things will be going well, really well. And then eh, not so fast, like 
something bad happens. Now, I'm just going to read the first few sentences of Ezekiel 38, and we'll all hear why most people, when they're if they're doing a, a year through the Bible reading, they're like, yeah, I don't understand that. I'm just going to skip that. <laughs> like, I just, it's yeah. all too weird. Right. Okay, so, right. so here, Ezekiel 38, verse 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog. There it is. Mm -hmm. Of the land of Magog, bing, bing, there's our next word, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, bing, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Okay, let's just stop there for a second. This is why people go, oh my gosh, I mean, no, I mean, you, this is not knowable, right. okay? This is Chinese, this is some Martian language I can't understand, so, I'm, so it doesn't matter to me, and I don't care, and I'm moving on. Right. The short version of this is, I try to, when I teach this at, a, at conferences uh, or churches or Bible studies, I say, listen, Bible prophecy can be difficult, but it's not designed to be unknowable. Right. Okay. right. So let's just trust for a moment that all Scripture really is profitable. It's inspired by God, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness yeah. so that the man and woman of God can be equipped for all good things. So this is what Paul tells Timothy. We have to trust this. This is important, so let's break it down. Now, when you break it down, what I tell people is, Let's set aside all those difficult words for a moment that we don't understand. Let's just go with what we can understand, mm -hmm. okay? God is speaking to somebody, okay? We know he's a somebody. He's not a nation himself. This Gog character is a character. Why do we know it's a character and not a country? Because God is saying, I'm, he's talking right to him. You know, Ezekiel say to this Gog person, from some place we don't understand, that I'm against you. Mm. God is against you. Mm. He's against you. And say to him that, again, I'm against you. Mm. And then as it goes through, I'm going to do a certain set of things, God says. I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to punish you. Yeah. She'll go. In fact, in verse 10, yes, in 10, thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil plan. Huh. So again, like you don't even know the countries, you don't know, okay, you're just like, I got a person and God's against him. So that makes mm -hmm. him a bad guy, right? He, this Gog character, is going to devise an evil plan. Well, that we can understand that. Mm -hmm. He's evil, he's doing bad things, and God has had it with him. And rather than redeeming him, God says, I'm against you, and I'm coming to get you. Yeah. Okay. Now, what else happens? Well, go back to verse 4. I will, God says, I will turn you about. I'm going to put hooks in your jaws, and I'm going to bring you out, you and all your army. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Whoa. He's not just a bad guy with an evil plan. He's got an army. Mm. And as you go through the text, you realize, even though we don't initially, just from the plain reading of the text, know what those countries are, this God character is building an alliance mm. of nations, it's not just him. He's going to build an alliance, political, economic, diplomatic, and military, and he's going after somebody. Mm. He's going after something. Now, the hint, of course, is that the last two chapters have been about the rebirth of Israel, so we might guess what's coming, though in Bible prophecy sometimes— you take a, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah will give a prophecy about a country, and then he'll shift to the next country, and then the next, and they're unrelated. But here, look at exactly what says, happens. In verse 7, God says to Gog, this character, evil character, be ready, get ready, be prepared. Hmm. Okay, prepared for what? Well, verse 8, after many days, you will be summoned in the latter years, in the last days. Oh, wow. bing, bing. We have a time reference, right. okay? This is an eschatological promise. Uh, this is something that's coming in the future, close to the return of the Messiah. This isn't something that has happened in, already in history. In the latter years, in the last days, you, Gog, will come into the land. 
What land? Well, the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations. Like, all right, well, that sounds like Israel, but Joel, you live there. I get it. Yeah. You're extrapolating, and I don't think that's fair. Yeah. Okay, well, let's keep reading. Verse 8, you will be gathered from many nations to, wait for it, the mountains of Israel. Wow. Whoa. And they say the people have been gathered back into the land, and now they're living securely. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Israel has to have some sense of feeling secure, and then something horrible is coming. And the mention of Israel just keeps going on and on. People can read the text. Joel, this is incredibly detailed, and it seems remarkable that we, you know, we in the church just miss so much of this. So all of a sudden, now we know who Gog is, and we know he's being somehow going to come into the land, the land of Israel, specifically mentioned. This is Carl Muller. Scripture tells us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Would you take a moment right now to pray for our staff at the Joshua Fund as they work to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus? We're in a battle against the evil one, and your prayers make all the difference. Joel, you got to fulfill what you just said, left us with at the end of that. So, so continue to help us understand this really incredible passage in in Ezekiel. Happy to do it, and 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 again, uh, and I'm, I keep saying I'm happy to do it every time you ask a question. But I think it's because, listen, I spent 20 years studying these things. Yeah. Because I struggled for a long time to find anything that seemed credible that unpacked these prophecies, and unfortunately, there's just not that much material. But there is. You just you have to go find it. A lot of the books are out of print, and you have to go do a lot of research. But I've done 20 years of research. I've written a novel about this, actually a whole novel series about how it might happen. And I wrote a nonfiction book, a number, you know, let's see, it's now, uh, that was 2006 it came out. So uh, 16 years ago, uh, called Epicenter. Yeah. Inside the Epicenter. Where do we get that term? Well, I, I coined it. I mean, I didn't coin the word, but I coined the use of the word epicenter to relate to Israel yes. and this region. Yes. And I named that first nonfiction book that I ever wrote epicenter. And I did it to unpack this particular prophecy. So okay. let's walk it through. Oh, and just on the epicenter thing, why epicenter? Because earlier in Ezekiel in chapter five, verse five, God says through the Hebrew prophet that I have set Jerusalem at the, wait for it, center of the nations. That's right. And all the rest of the nations are around her. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Then here in Ezekiel 38, in verse 12, God says, I'm going to bring this enemy of, of Israel against the people who are living at the center of the world. That's the English. But if you go into the Hebrew, the when it says the center of the world, the actual Hebrew word is the belly button of the world, the navel of the world. Yeah. Now, I look at those two verses and I say, listen, God sees the world and he loves the world. We know that from John 3, 16. But what country does he see as most important? What country does he see as the center of his entire plan and purpose? He says it. He says Israel is at the center, and Jerusalem is at the center of Israel, yes. and the Temple Mount is at the center of Jerusalem, and that's, uh, you know, it's like a series of concentric circles. One might also argue this is a set of bullseyes. Yeah. <laughs> this is the target. It's a different way to and look God at it. And God said, yes. I have chosen you, Israel, and I have yeah. chosen you, Jerusalem, to put my name there, but that's where we get that from. Now, yes. very quickly, so Gog. So Gog is not a nation. It's a person. We said that. And it's not a, a, a personal name. We're not looking for Steve Gog. We're not looking for Carl Gog. We're not looking for Joel Gog or Dimitri or Ahmed Mohammed Gog. It's not a last name. It's not a proper name. It's a title. And I would liken it to a pharaoh or a czar, right? When we say that uh, Moses spoke to pharaoh, well, pharaoh wasn't his name. Right. Pharaoh was his title as a ruler. Uh, like when we say Jesus Christ, Christ was not his family name. 
Christ is the Greek <laughs> word for Messiah, yes. right? He's Jesus, the Messiah. But people act, you know, they, they, sometimes they think it's like, you know, it was Mary and Joseph yeah. Christ. And it was the Christ family on the mailbox. It said Christ. Yeah. No. So Gog is a title. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, this Gog figure is from the land of Magog. You're like, Joel, okay, that's not helping. Okay. So I did all this historical research for the book Epicenter. And what did I find? I found that Magog is the land that we today know as Russia. Mm-hmm. And it may very well have included some of its neighboring countries. We can't be so precise. Why? Because Magog is a name of a tribe. We find it in Genesis chapter 10. It's one of the descendants of Noah. Mm-hmm. And what happens is after the flood and Noah's Ark, Noah and the families, they start having children and they have children and they have children and they begat so-and-so. And Magog becomes one of the descendants and these nations all spread out. And now we can trace it historically. Magog settled north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea in the region we call today Russia and some of the former Soviet republics. We can't be more precise than that. You're like, now I know there are skeptics listening. They're like, Joel, dude, I mean, seriously, you're just saying that. Well, first of all, go read Epicenter. You can get it at the library. You don't have to buy it. But I'm just saying, I'm not you know, promoting it. I'm just saying that's where I have all this information. But my father and I traveled to Moscow a number of years ago. And uh, my dad's family escaped out of Russia, as I mentioned in the last uh, podcast. He's a first-generation American Mm -hmm. uh, born to Orthodox Jews who fled from Russia, okay? So this is, we have family roots on this stuff. So my dad had never been there. Uh, You and I, of course, when uh, um, uh, we think we met each other, but we don't really know if we know each other. (laughs) But back in 1986, we both traveled on a a ministry project uh, there to the then Soviet Union. Fascinating. But my dad had never been. So I said, Dad, I'm researching a series of books about this prophecy. Would you want to come with me and go see the old country? He's like, okay. So we went. And we went to the State Historical Museum, hmm. which is like Russia's version of the Smithsonian Institution. And, and it, it's right located on Red Square next to the Kremlin, just like all the major buildings, you know, museums in Washington are near the White House and the Capitol. All that to say, we went in and we went to all the historical sections of all the archaeology and the bones and the, what did we find? We found that the Russians openly and proudly talk about their history of the Magogites. Mm -hmm. They don't use the term Magogite, they say Scythian. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you look historically, like to Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, he says the Magogites the people from Noah, are the people whom the Greeks call Scythians. Mm -hmm. The Russians are totally open about their heritage is Scythian. Mm -hmm. So that's Magogite. It's just a different word. It's like saying Christ and Messiah. Same people group, different words. Interesting. That's a huge clue. If you're being a historical detective, you've just hit the mother load. Right. This is a Russian dictator. Mm-hmm. An evil Russian leader. Now, I'll just go through a few more. Just, you know, I'm sure we're running out of time, but he's a prince, right? He's a leader. He's a, he's a government leader. He might even be royalty or think of himself as royalty. That's what verse 2 says of Ezekiel 38. And this, he's this prince. Okay, Magog is the macro title, but Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Carl, this is fascinating because Rosh is the actual word from which the word Russia comes from. Yes. If you go back to all the history books of Russia, the actual original name was Rus. Right. Uh, so anyway, we'll get into it. But the point is, I totally believe that Rosh is Russia. But other scholars don't see that. They think because Rosh in the Bible can be used as a proper name, mm-hmm. it, but Rosh also means my head. The person's head is called a Rosh. In Hebrew. Mm-hmm. So some Bibles will translate it. He's the chief prince. He's the head prince of these other places, Meshach and Tubal. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I see Rosh as a proper name, but I get that some people don't. But okay, so let's say he's the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Meshach 
is Moscow. <laughs> and Tubal, one of the biggest rivers in Russia, is called the Tubal wow. River. Mm-hmm. And there's a city on the Tubal River. It's called Tobolsk. Okay? <laughs> like, these are multiple identifiers. So mm-hmm. even after 2,600 years, you can pretty much nail down where this is from. Right. Now, again, I mentioned that it may be other countries besides Russia, but it's definitely Russia. And there's one more clue in the the text. When you go through the whole text, what you'll find is two references, uh, but I'll just, just, uh, like one is Ezekiel 38, 15. God says to Gog, I will bring you from the remotest parts of the north. Okay, then there, in, in chapter 39, the prophecy continues. It's not even contained in one chapter. Yeah. You need two to tell the story. It's one of the most detailed end times prophecies in the Bible, at least in the Old Testament. God says in 39 verse 2, speaking to Gog, I will turn you around, drive you on, and take you up from the remotest parts of the north and wow. bring you against the mountains of Israel. Now, that's as clear as you can get, right? Yeah. So what happens? If all geography in the Bible is related to Jerusalem, unless there's some specific reason that the text is telling you that this has nothing to do with Jerusalem. But in this case, we absolutely know it's related. North of what? You're coming from the remotest parts of the north compared to what? Well, clearly from Israel, Mm -hmm. from Jerusalem. Now, pull out your phones, pull up your Google Maps, and look at Jerusalem and go due north, okay? You go due north, and where do you get? You get to Moscow. Moscow. You get Mm -hmm. to Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go too far, you hit the North Pole, and you start coming into Canada. Now, people (laughs) say, well, how do you know the Canadians aren't the bad guys? Because that's then going south, right? Once you hit the North Pole, now you're going south (laughs) once you go over the top, right? So you can only go so far and have it still be north. It's Mm -hmm. Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, Russia builds an alliance with several other countries. We don't have time to unpack them all. But the key one is in verse 5, because the first country that's mentioned in the list is that Russia is going to build an alliance with Persia. Wow. Now, Persia, Persia yeah, until 1935, Persia was the official legal name of the country we today know as the Islamic Republic of Iran. Okay. So Russia and Iran are going to form an alliance. Mm-hmm. And then when you look at the other countries, the next country is Cush in Hebrew. Now, in many Bibles, including New American Standard, which is my main go-to text, it says Ethiopia. But the word Cush in the Bible is a broader territory than, than Ethiopia. It's mostly what we would, in modern days, call Sudan. Now, as long as I've been writing and speaking about this, Carl, Sudan has been an ally of Russia and an ally of Iran and a threat to Israel. This is where Osama bin Laden lived when he got kicked out of Afghanistan for a while. This is a terrorist regime engaged in genocide ah, until 2020. What happened then? The Abraham Accords. And Sudan decided to make peace with Israel. And you're like, well, then that blows your theory. Does it? Iran had peace with Israel until 1979 Mm -hmm. when the Shah was overthrown and the Ayatollah took over and now hates Israel with a a genocidal passion. Russia technically right now isn't, not an ally, but a friend, a good acquaintance, let's say, with Israel, right? Right now, Russia is not threatening to attack Israel. So you say, well, Joel, you're just blowing smoke. Well, I don't think I'm doing that. And in fact, what we're watching is, and then look at other countries. One of the countries is Gomer. That's not where Gomer Pyle is from. That's (laughs) Turkey. Now, as I describe in previous shows and I describe in the book Enemies and Allies, Turkey is a NATO ally. It is an American ally. But under its current president, Recep Erdogan, it's shifting from a Western identity and alliance towards the dark side, towards Russia, towards Iran. Look, we can't go through all of them, but but uh, another one, I'll just say one other one is put. Okay, in the Bible it says uh, put is in the list. And I say to people, where do you put put? Put. <laughs> well, again, if you asked Josephus 2,000 years ago in his Antiquities of the Jews, one of the probably the greatest history of the Jewish people, he says that put is what the Greeks call ancient Libyos, 
Today, we call it Libya. Okay, now, ancient Libya was a larger territory than current Libya, so this could include Algeria, maybe Tunisia, we don't know. But certainly Libya right now, ally of Russia, ally of Iran, you know, a basket case of a country, tragically, and hates Israel. So I say all that because there are others, but I think just the, the point is, in the future, someday, the Bible says that Russia is going to form an alliance with several countries. The main one is Iran, mm -hmm. and then there'll be a group of other countries. Now, countries like Egypt, not mentioned yeah. in the alliance. Now you say, well, did God just forget about Egypt? No. You know, don't you remember, Joel, the history of Yul Brenner and uh, Charlton Heston, you know, and the whole, you know, history of Egypt hating Israel? Yes, I remember that history. But in 1979, Egypt made peace with Israel. Mm -hmm. And as I report in Enemies and Allies, the current president of Egypt, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, I've met with him four times and seen him a fifth time, and he loves Israel. Mm -hmm. And he loves Netanyahu when Netanyahu was prime minister. Very close relationship between Egypt and Israel. Interesting. One more. The nation of Babylon is not mentioned in the Bible. The word Iraq is never mentioned in the Bible. But even the historical names for the country we know is Iraq, Babel, Babylon, Babylonia, Shinar, Mesopotamia, all those ancient names, none of them are used in this list of allied countries. And you ask, did God forget about one of the worst enemies of Israel ever? Mm -hmm. up to and including Saddam Hussein. No, he didn't forget. Somehow, Carl, and I'll wrap up with this point, and then you take us wherever you want to yeah. start landing the plane. Because yeah. we haven't gone to what happens in the prophecy, but but the key is the setup to me. Sure. Because God wins, and he saves Israel. So, spoiler alert. But the key is what God is saying. So take an Etch-a-Sketch and shake it of all we've just said. Let's just put a few things back on the Etch-a-Sketch. Okay, to keep it simple, there's going to be an evil dictator in the country we know today as Russia. That's number one. Number two, he's going to form an alliance with a group of countries because he has an evil plan. Three, Iran is going to be the chief among equals, but there will be other countries too. This will be a military attack against Israel. It will happen in the last days of history, mm -hmm. meaning in the lead up. That's the terms that the Lord uses in prophecy to say the lead up to the second coming of Christ. And it, this all happens at a time in history when Israel has been rebuilt as a country, mm -hmm. as a sovereign nation state. Israel has Jews pouring back in from all over the world. These Jewish people are rebuilding the ancient ruins. They've built a, a strong army. They feel secure. Yeah. But this alliance is coming, and the alliance doesn't include the two most important historic enemies of Israel, Egypt Babylon. and Iraq. Yeah. Now, we are living in the first window in all of the 2,600 years since the prophecy was written in which all the pieces that God said would fall into place in the last days— for this apocalyptic attack against Israel, they're falling into place, they seem to be, right now. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the prophecy will happen in the next few weeks or months or years. Maybe God kicks the prophetic can up the road 50 years, 100 years. He can do it if he wants. But we've never, yeah. ever seen the convergence of all the major pieces of this prophecy ever come into this alignment until right now. And that's why we should be watching yeah. this thing really closely. Yeah. Well, Joel, uh, on behalf of, you know, just everyone who's listened so far, thank you. This has been incredible. And that is exactly why we need to continue to look into the scripture and look into history at the same time as we look at the current political developments, because frankly, God is moving in the epicenter, not just acting, but fulfilling or filling, as you say, his prophecy. 
superintending events, yeah. superintending events, and moving us in that way. And I think it is it's absolutely vital that that we all uh, remember that the Word of God is true and that it is effective and in instructing us in all of those things that we need to be doing right now and to be praying, as you mentioned before, praying for peace at the same time as we understand these times and prepare for what what is coming. So, uh, Joel, thank you for really a great exposition of this passage. And I know we'll come back to this. I know because it's such a such a central understanding of the way we work and, and understand this this area. And uh, just thanks again for your time. I agree. And I think maybe we should even do a part two to this one, because chapter 39, it's really important to understand what then happens and what are the implications of this thing that we, because we've just basically set up. Yes. How dangerous it is and that it could be coming. Like, it, I mean, honestly, I don't know if it's coming in my lifetime or soon, but for the first time in my life, I've started thinking, wow, is it possible? Like, I wasn't around in 1948 when the prophecies of Israel came to pass, yeah. but is it possible like that I could be a, a living and here in Israel at a time when the next major set of prophecies come to pass? My goodness. I don't know. But it's worth exploring a little bit further. Head over to the joshuafund.com website. Sign up for our newsletter. Sign up to learn more about what we're doing. Uh, when you get our emails, you'll hear about what God is doing, not just geopolitically, but in the lives of men and women in the epicenter as we seek at the Joshua Fund to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. So grateful that you've listened to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg.